Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here for Joyrider TV, live from the Wild Wind Workshop. Oh, yes. And this week we are on time. Thank you very much. So um, what we're entering into here is a live question and answer session. You guys are bringing the questions and I am going to see if I can answer them, which I will one way or another. If um, you are watching this later, so not live, um, that you will know it's not live because it won't say live in the corner of the screen. If you do have any questions, then you could just pop them in the comments below and then I'll either answer in the comments typing or I'll answer you in next week's live Q&A session, uh, which will be the same time as today only next week. Hello to everybody who's tuning in already. Hello to Max in Rosenheim, Germany. Great to have you on board. Max is firing in with a question already. I'll get onto that shortly. Hello to Beach Club. Nice to have you on board. Uh, I think this is actually the first time that we've had Beach Club in the live Q&A, so nice to uh, have you here. Uh, we've got Not Ausgang in Germany. Rodrigo in somewhere in South America, I think. Could be wrong. And Lift and Drag Racing. Hello. Great to have you with us. I think that's the first time for Lift and Drag Racing as well. Thanks for coming. Brazil for Rodrigo. Great stuff. Um, so the main theme that I've been going for this week in the Wild Wind Workshop is reconditioning Hobie Cat rudder systems. Mm. Yeah, if you follow... Uh, my progress on Instagram, um, I think the vibe that I'm going to go for is rather than doing a video about every single little thing that I'm doing, which can get quite time consuming because I've got quite a lot to do. Uh, I'm just going to take photographs and then you can follow the progress on Instagram. And if you do see something on Instagram that you think, oh, I'd like to see more of that, you can just comment on the picture and then um, that might provoke me to make a picture, uh, a video. So um, here, this is what I've been up to. So um, taking these rudder stocks and basically where the um, the holes have become elongated or enlarged, which means you won't get the rudder perfect. I've been um, just cleaning them out and then uh, filling them with an epoxy a thickened epoxy paste, which um, like maybe tomorrow or the day after, I'll drill that ready for the new bolt. I've done the same for the cam pin. I don't know how well that's going to work because the cam pin is quite sharp. And on some of them, if I can find one, um, yeah, on some of them, I've uh, also epoxied where the rudder pin will go so rather than using tape on the bush I can then drill the correct size for the bush into that epoxy and bush it into there which will make a much a much longer lasting solution for that bushing so very productive um I'm sure you're all into this what I've also done all right I'm just gonna we're in the workshop which means going to get stuff is um here is one of these and um what i've had on quite a few rudder blades is the inserts that go into the rudder blade these have been coming loose so they can slip out but uh the bigger problem is if they can move sideways or up and down so what i've done again is taken some epoxy paste uh taken this out cleaned it up and then pasted it put it back in so now these are absolutely solid so this sort of thing is going to make those little everything i've done here is going to make a very small difference but then if we add all those small differences together um it should make quite a significant difference in how um we can tune the boat up uh, get the rudders absolutely perfect every time very nice indeed all right 
Yeah, so Rodrigo in Brazil, nice to have you all the way from Brazil there, man. And then not Ausgang, emergency exit in Austria, 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 uh, Dart 18 uh, team there. And then we've got Shizo. I'm just going to call you Shizo, if I may. Um, have you ever... All right, I'm going to come on to the questions in a second. Then we've got Thomas also in Germany. Great to have you on board, Thomas. That clock is certainly ticking now to when you're going to be walking the wild wind beach once more. And then we've got Chris in Texas. Good morning. All right, so I'm just going to go on to Max's question first because we have to do the questions in order. So Max says, is there any hint like a floppy leech that the jib should be replaced by a new one. What are the indicators that it's time for a new set of sails besides that they're totally ripped in half? Yeah, um, the first thing that will go with a jib, if it's because uh, Max has got a tie pan and a Dart 15, I believe, both of which I think will have not a fully battened jib. And um, I just happen to have a set of sails drawn here. Uh, on this board and what will happen first is the leech of the jib will start to lose its shape and you'll get it so that no matter what you do with the position of the jib sheeting angle if you've got that choice or if you've got a choice of holes in a clue plate on the jib whatever you do you can't stop the back of the jib from either flapping or when you sheet it in, if we draw the shape of the jib from either the top or the bottom, so you've got a curve, and then when you sheet in, you get like an, a sort of S curve in the leech. Um, that would generally be a sign that the sail has lost its shape. Uh, for us here on the beach uh, at Wildwind, the time when we know um, it's time to replace sails, because we're not keeping our boats kind of like in. Um, we're not going to the world championships with these boats. We're just keeping them so that they are uh, strong enough and robust enough to deal with sailing in strong winds every single day. So what we find is after sails get to a certain age, it's like they'll start ripping quite frequently. You'll get it repaired where it's ripped and then sail again and then it will rip again, either from an impact or it might rip on the repair. And that basically means that the cloth has gone. Um, the cloth is no longer strong. Uh, so like with your mainsail, a nice new mainsail, if you capsize land in the mainsail, uh, the mainsail will probably be fine. But when your sail gets to a certain age, if you capsize land in the mainsail, uh, you will go through it quite easily. So that's when you know that maybe it's time to start looking at new sails because um, you can get them repaired. But then what happens is where the sail is repaired. So if we've got a repair here, it'll be where the repair joins the old bit of sail. This will be a really weak point here and uh, then it will rip there. So then you'll have to put a bigger repair on and that will just keep happening until you've pretty much built a new sail anyway. So um, that is how I would say um, it's time to change the sails. Thanks for the question there, Max. Um, it sounds like Max is thinking about getting new sails. I think that's a good idea. Um, so Shizo has got a question which is have you ever attempted to get up on the speed stick with a spinnaker um he says also would appreciate if you could make a video on spinnaker setup and sailing of a hobie 16 yeah um so in the second part of your question um i have done because we don't have spinnakers on our 16s here at Wildwind, Greece. But when I was in Wildwind, Mauritius, they do have spinnakers on all of their 16s there. And I did make some videos 
on the sailing and use of the spinnakers on the 16s there. So you could check those out. If you can't find that video, put it in the actual comments, um, not the live chat, and I will send you a link to that video. But um, get on the speed stick with the spinnaker. What I would find is on pretty much every boat, your top speed is generally with two, it depend, certainly depends on the wind strength, but your top actual, the fastest you could get the boat to go is in a strong wind starting on a beam reach. So um, can we turn this into our boat? Yep, yeah, we can. Starting on a beam reach there. And then every time the hull lifts, uh, that pressure, that, um, the, what is it, that energy that is lifting the hull, we can transfer that energy into more boat speed by taking the boat further downwind. So that is how we're getting the big speeds. With the spinnaker up, yes, if the wind is lighter, you will get more speed with the spinnaker up. But for the ultimate top speed of the boat, it's with two sails where you're going to get the highest speed. Because once we get into a certain amount of wind with the kite up, um, we the spinnaker is going to make us just have to sail so deep downwind that we're not actually getting more boat speed. Because most spinnakers um, have got way too much shape in them. So way too much curve. So when we get to a certain speed, all that we can do is turn more downwind to stop it from flapping. If you did have a spinnaker made which was totally flat, then possibly that would be the ultimate high wind um, rig to have. Um, but your spinnaker would have to be as flat as a board to um, not just get sucked off downwind, um, which... Um, although pleasurable, it would not actually give you that top speed. So that's what I think about the top speed with the kite up. There's certain boats where the um, the speed you can get with the spinnaker and without it is more similar. Like on the modern F-18s, like the C2 that we have here, um, you can absolutely rip it with the spinnaker up. Uh, over 23 knots and then with two sails it is difficult to get it to go over 23 knots although it will so on those sort of boats it's a bit more similar but on the 16 you'll certainly go faster top speed in in a strong wind without the spinnaker up so that's what i think there we go all right so we've got jazz on board hi jazz um, who asks, can a person sail a 16 foot cat anywhere they want? Like around the country and stop at beaches for a break and camping, like very long distance sail, or do you need one of those big cats with a cabin? And have you done it before? Um, yeah, with the thing that holds you back, from doing this sort of adventure sailing on a small boat, like the boats that we talk about here, is safety, basically. So if you were going to have nice weather and it looks stable and you're planning a route which has many places where you can stop. So, like, for example, if you're setting off, from where it is that you're launching from if you're setting off from where it is you're setting off from and the next place where there's actually a beach where you can put your boat is let's say 50 miles away then perhaps that isn't so safe because you're really um committing to sailing a long distance because what we have to keep in mind is things can happen like even if you've got brand new rigging your mask could come down um, you could have some damage, something could go wrong. 
the wind could completely die or could go, you know, pick up massively. So having regular safe places where you can land, I would say that is essential if you're looking at doing some long distance sailing. So what would be a safe distance between beaches? Yeah, that's a tough one. Like how far would you want to go? Like maybe five miles? Because then when you get to two, that means at two and a half miles, that's the furthest you'll be away from the place where you can land. So you need to consider that. Also consider the wind direction in relation to the land. You want to have the wind direction some kind of little bit onshore so that if you do have some sort of catastrophic gear failure, you will find it a lot easier to get back to the land. Whereas if the wind is offshore, like something quite that seems quite um, tame could happen, like you could have a broken main halyard or your mainsail could fall down or get damaged. On most catamarans, um, you can't sail much above a beam reach just on the jib. So the wind direction in relation to the land is very important to consider. But there's no, there's nothing to say you can't go on some absolutely amazing journeys on a 16 foot or 18 foot or maybe even 15 foot catamaran. Um, as long as you do keep these safety considerations in mind. Um, yeah, you could have a great time if you've got a, a really good forecast and an area where you have got a lot of safe beaches to land, then um, lovely old job. That sounds like a nice day out. All right. So um, you may have noticed on the board here, I have got a picture of some sails with some numbers drawn on it. Um, this is actually my first preloaded question, and I thought I would save a bit of time by doing a bit of homework before entering into the Q&A this week. I know it's the first time I'm actually doing something um, in advance to be more efficient, but this question actually came from David on Patreon. Uh, David asks, uh, firstly, what is the standard position of the telltales on a set of Hobie 16 sales. All right, should be quite self-explanatory, but I will explain just because maybe it isn't self-explanatory. So um, the top, top telltale on the main sail, this means that it's 13 centimetres up from the second batten we we're right there, second batten, 13 centimetres up. And then where the telltale is, perpendicular to the luff of the sail. So we're coming square off the luff of the sail. It's 48 centimetres. So where I've drawn it here, it's not 48 centimetres down the batten. It's actually from where the telltale goes into the sail to the luff. That's 48 centimetres there. So these are the positions of all of the telltales. This is on a fairly new set of sails we've got here. So I'd like to think that is pretty standard. So the second one down, uh, so that's the fourth batten, 38 centimetres above the fourth batten and 62 centimetres from the luff. I can read all this out. Um, then the next one, 64 centimetres from batten number seven and 70 centimetres from the luff. And then the jib telltales. 28 centimetres from the luff, 18 centimetres above the batten. Again, perpendicular to the luff. So we're actually measuring like that. Um, and then the last one uh, in the second panel there, 72 centimetres above the batten, 43 centimetres uh, uh, from the luff there. So there you go. Um, I'm sure there's plenty of time to have paused that and written it down or screenshotted it or something. If you would like those measurements, uh, which does actually mean I can now 
rub this out. Although that's it's been on there for some time, I'm just going to utilize a little bit of uh, moisture. Okay, so the second part of David's question was just um, what is the benefit of leech telltales on, um, on your sale and how to best use them? So if this is our sale, I think the red is not looking too vibrant. Um, Okay, so this is our sale, and then we might have leech telltales on the sale. Now, leech telltales, it is more common to have leech telltales on a sale of a, uh, a higher aspect rig, such as an F-18 or a Tornado. Um, so these leech telltales, it would just be single streamers coming off the back of the sale I would generally put my leech telltales halfway between the battens so that you're not getting disturbed air off the battens. And then what we're looking for with the leech telltales is to have two thirds or um, if you've got four, then perhaps three out of four. If you've got three, then two out of three flying at all times. Uh, what happens with the leech telltales, can we see that? Okay, is, so there's the sail looking from above. There's the leech telltale. The leech telltales just tell you if the sail is in too tight at that point. What would usually happen is it would be the lowest point that would be oversheeted first because the main sheet is having a much more direct effect on the bottom of the sail, whereas the top of the sail is going to start to open as we go higher because it's further away from the main sheet. So we're getting this twist in the sail as it goes up because of the distance from the main sheet. So for that reason, it is likely that the bottom of the sail is going to be oversheeted first, if that sounds all right. Um, so what happens when the sail is oversheeted? If we can draw the wind going around the sail, if it's in too tight, the wind is going to get to the back of the sail and just push round like this if it's too tight which is going to mean that that telltale disappears and that telltale will be just getting blown directly off the back of the sail, which means while you're sailing the boat, you won't be able to see it. Um, so if you've just got the bottom one that's just gone round the back, that is OK. We're saying that is all right. Um, however, if it's the bottom two, then that means you've got the sail in too tight and you just need to ease it. Um, what is the reason for having leech telltales um, as, as well as or instead of telltales in the body of the sail? The reason is that they're very quick and easy to see. If you've got a very tall rig or you're a bit short sighted to see a telltale up here in the body of the sail, and not all sails have little handy windows uh, so that you can see your telltales. That's going to be pretty difficult to see. Whereas the leech telltale, you'll just be able to look up and immediately see if your sail's in too tight or not. Um, and then you can trim the sail accordingly. So there we go. I hope that helps. So that is telltales, position and leech telltales, uh, what they do and why we use them. There we go. So lift and drag racing says, should we upgrade our wildcat to a deck sweeper setup? 
what are the pros and cons in your opinion? All right, nice question. So with the I think the uh, hey, I'm gonna have to buy some more pens because the age of the colors is uh is losing us, leaving us pretty fast. So um let's just for those of you who don't know on an F18 like the Wildcat. The traditional sail, the, the sail that the boat originally came with or was designed with is a traditional sail which has a boom at the bottom. Uh, I think it's got eight battens, something like that. This is not to scale. Now, more recently, I think it would be probably definitely in the last 10 years. The trend, let's just draw the mast, has been this new design of sail, which is called a deck sweeper for reasons which will become apparent very quickly. So with the, um, I think what we can talk about is the negative uh, points of the deck sweeper straight away. As we can see on this very nicely drawn diagram, if this is the boat and this is the boat on this one, the deck sweeper does do what it says, which is it actually comes all the way down and meets the trampoline. This, uh, depending on the design of the trampoline, this space at the back, your main sheet would go on there. So that's the main sheet. This space here um, for the sailors to pass through can be varying sizes. And it is the trend not to have much space there at all. So that might just be a very small hole. And this is the major down. It's a very obvious downside of the deck sweeper is you've just got this very small hole uh, when you want to cross the boat, um, which at first does feel quite awkward indeed. And my one tip for crossing the boat with a deck sweeper is lead with the head. It's like it's very similar to crewing a boat which has a low boom is lead with the head. So when you want to cross the boat, go head first through the gap and then the rest of your body will follow. Whereas if you go for a sort of sideways through or anything else, that's when you're going to get, you're more likely to get snagged as you pass through difficult times. Now, uh, so moving across the boat, this does um, cause small problems with a deck sweeper. The second problem that the deck sweeper brings to the table is if you want to do anything on the other side of the boat so you might want to lift the dagger board on the leeward side perhaps you haven't got the downhaul or the jib or something cleated on the leeward side then there is a chance that you're going to have to go to the leeward side of the boat which is a lot more of an effort when you can't just quickly nip down there you've got to go either through the hole or for the crew going around the front of the mast is also the option and um and it is quite an efficient way of getting around the boat even without the deck sweeper sail to go around the front of the mast does mean you get across the boat very quickly like if you're going trapeze to trapeze on attack um if when you come in from the trapeze, you come in to a standing up position, pretty racy. Um, but then you can just run around the front of the mast, hold on to the diamond wires for support. You could be on the, the other side of the boat extremely quickly compared to going underneath the boom. So that is actually quite a positive um, 
thing that the deck sweeper has brought about. But um, that is a negative thing, is that have you got jobs to do on the other side of the boat? If you have, it's a bit more of a pain. What else is a negative point? Perhaps it's lighter winds and the crew is on the leeward side, helm is on the windward side. It is a lot less sociable because you have got this wall in between you, which um, there's definitely a wall between you making communications a bit harder, um, less good for just chatting on the boat. Um, however, I suppose a positive thing is it does help with your social distancing, thereby having this wall in between the pair of you on the boat, um, which these days is quite positive. Um, but um, all right. So the main positive with the deck sweeper. So I think that's all of the uh, negatives. Actually, the last one is it uh, depending on the manufacturer of the boat, it can be a bit more time consuming to rig um, with the C2 deck sweeper. Um, it is more time consuming to rig because there's two battens that you have to put in once it's up. One goes from here down to here. And um, it is quite fiddly putting these battens in. And the second one, and this is a real fiddle, um, it goes down here um, to support this bottom part of the sail because you can't get the bottom part of the sail in the mast track with this batten in. So that is, it probably adds a couple of minutes to your rigging time. But um, those are the negative sides of a deck sweeper sail. Now, the biggest and most, um, how would you say, significant benefit of the deck sweeper sail is the performance enhancement you will get from that sail on the boat. Because what the deck sweeper is doing is it's bringing um, more sail area, like the mast is the same length. So the top of the sail is in the same place, but you're not having as much top batten. Uh, it's not as big. And you're moving sail area down because the sail area in square meters or square feet has to stay exactly the same because that is the class rules. So we're getting more sail area lower down. What is the benefit of that? Well, it's making the rig less top heavy which means when you get more wind that power that you're getting on your rig is going to give you less hull flying and more speed so it's going to come that extra wind that extra power is going to give you more forwards drive than having a higher more sail area higher up um which is going to just encourage the boat to fly a hull so having this sail area lower down, definitely quicker. Um, the other point of efficiency that the deck sweeper is said to give is where it hits the trampoline. This creates an end plate like you'd have on the end of an, if this is a an aeroplane, like at the end of the wing, you have an end plate there. And what that does is it stops air from spilling over the side so like here wind comes in this bottom panel of the sail you're going to lose a fair bit underneath whereas on old the old deck sweeper here it can't actually go underneath so you're really going to maximize from that sail area down there um yeah so i would say those are the benefits the other benefit is it looks cool i think the deck sweeper sail certainly looks very mean. If you were to go to an F-18 competition without a deck sweeper um, sail, you would not be seen as a threat on the race course because the deck sweeper sail, it says, I mean business. So there we go. So should you upgrade one? I would say, um, yes, I think so. If you're looking at if you're looking at changing your sail, then it's got to be for a deck sweeper, not for a 
uh, whatever the opposite of deck sweeper is called. Um, so there you go. All right. So I hope that helps. Oh, and lift and drag racing is Kuro 5150. By the way, just been getting the YouTube channel set up. Team gear ordered before the season starts. We will still suck, but at least we'll do it in style. Now, that is the um, that's very important. Matching gear is as important as a deck sweeper sale, I would say. Um, if your team has got some elements. Now, let's talk matching gear. To have absolutely everything matching, I think is perhaps just one little element too much. You want to have between the helm and the crew one or two things that are different. So shirt color should be the same, I think. Um, buoyancy aid, if it's going over the top, I think the same. Trapeze harness, no need to be the same. That could be different. Trousers could be different. But to have the main elements the same, but then make that look your own. Mm. Hat colour. Depends. If you've gone for matching trousers, harness, buoyancy aid, shirt, different hats. Nice. Whereas if you're absolutely matching, I think can be just one bead too much there. All right. So I um, hope that helps. Sebu, who is Thomas, two months and five days to go before he's going to walk the Wild Wind Beach. Tell me the settings for your GoPro, GoPro, please. OK. Um, yeah, I can't quite remember off the top of my head, but um, I've been going between changing the settings like in ProTune and just going for default. And um, what I'm going for is let's think if i'm going out for a short video like let's say less than 10 minutes then i will film in 4k um because by filming in 4k it gives you the option then to zoom in a bit uh to crop into the picture if you want to get a little bit more detail whereas if you film in 1080 um it's less juicy but if you want to go into the picture to get a bit more detail on a certain aspect, uh, you're going to really see the quality difference there. So if it's shorter, I'll go 4K um, and then I'll just generally have it set to wide. Uh, I don't go super view because that does leave it looking a bit bent. I use the 360 camera for all of the bent stuff. Um, and then if I am going for longer than 10 minutes, I'll set it to 1080 because otherwise it just uses too much space on the memory card. Um, so it's the memory card, but then also the editing. Um, if you're editing 4K, you need a much more powerful computer. And my computer is pretty old and um, I have to nurse it through a lot of the editing process. So doing the longer videos in 1080 definitely helps there. So that's pretty much what I'm doing. Stabilization is always on set to maximum, whatever that is, um, which certainly is a great feature of the newer cameras. That's for sure. All right. But um, when you come out, Thomas, we could go through some more settings. We could even do some experimentation. Um, but then what I'm doing actually if you think that um, the sailing footage that I get looks good, it is pretty much with standard GoPro settings. But then what I'm doing afterwards in um, I edit my videos using DaVinci Resolve, which is free. Um, I use the color correction in there and I just bring the. I make the darks a bit darker and the lights a bit less sorry the dark's a bit less dark no what do i do i i because i'm filming where it's really bright i do make the uh the darks darker 
and then I bring the lights down a little bit as well, and then I boost the mids, um, which I think leaves it looking pretty good. That's what I think. There we go. So Shizo says, oh, great, missed that. Oh, okay. Uh, where am I? Sorry, something just happened. Um, sorry, scrolling back. I haven't had to scroll back for some time now. Um, oh, it's pretty flat, like the Jenica on the 29er. I think it's talking about the Spinnaker on the Hobie 16. Yeah, so if you have got a flat Spinnaker, then more speed can be on its way. Unbelievable, you may think. But yes, we've been going for 40 minutes already. So I'm going to take a short commercial break. Mm, tasty. All right. We've got Stefan on board feeding ravens uh, for filling the holes in bushings, mix micro balloons or ground glass fiber into the epoxy. It's way harder than pure epoxy. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Um, so I'm making like an epoxy paste using... Um, we're not calling them micro balloons. What are we calling them? Micro bubbles. But um, it's like ridiculously fine. So I'm making a mix with this stuff and then putting that in. So for that strength. And also it's a lot easier to work with than just the regular epoxy, which will is very runny. Whereas when we've mixed it with the micro bubbles, it is um, a lot thicker. So it's more like a paste. Thanks for that, Stefan. We've got Alexander on board, who says my sales are from 1974. However, no rips. Both look perfect, although the jib is flapping. Would the performance increase rapidly if I replace the jib? Do I re need to replace both or just the jib on the Hobie 16? So the second part of that question is, do you need to replace both? It's only if you can get a jib, which it's for cosmetic reasons, you'd want to replace both. Because I think especially if you've got colored sails, you do want your sails to match. If you're not getting your sails matching, then what you want to do, I think, from a cosmetic point of view, is to get the jib in one of the colors that is represented on the main sail. Uh, because that looks pretty sweet. Um, if the jib is a completely different colour to the mainsail, can look a little bit like circuses in town. Um, if if in doubt, just get a white one, I think. Um, would the performance increase rapidly if I replace the jib? Yeah, you will see some uh, improvement in the performance, because also if the jib has got to an age where it has lost its shape, it's going to be a bit baggier. You're not going to um, have that nice curve in the sail so much anymore. So replacing the jib is going to give you quite a performance boost. All right. Max is saying no wind in uh, Rosenheim, Germany today. Sorry about that. All right. I think. All right. No, I don't. We've got Larcenti. Greetings from Michigan, USA. Possibly buying my first Hobie 16 tomorrow. Now, there is a big day. Congratulations. Hope that the deal comes off without a hitch and uh, you're the proud owner of a 16 by this time tomorrow. Good luck with that. Um, let's know how you get on. All right. Not Ausgang says... In response to Max, doesn't matter that there's no wind in Rosenheim. There is no lake. Or oh, I think we're going to start a bit of a fight here. Um, we've got Robin in Florida. Hello. Nice to have you with us, as always. Got Luca. Hello to everyone and thank you for the great content. Welcome. Thanks for tuning in. All right. So this is uh, the Is There a Lake in Rosenheim, Germany? Max says... 15 minutes bike ride to Lake Simsey. So there you go. 
All right, bit of German chat going on. Very nice. Um, there we go. Oh, we've got Laura on board to Fleet 240 Santa Cruz. Hello. Great to have you on board. As always. Um, yeah, there's some German chat has started there. Um, but we've got two on board in Texas. Hi, two. Great. Uh, nice that you... Toots always there. Very nice. And we've got John Claude in Trinidad. Hello. Hope that it's all cooking out there nicely. All right. So Fleet 240 Santa Cruz says, do you reset your outhaul to different settings for different sailing conditions? Um, not consciously, no. Um, so this is on the Hobie 16. Do I ever change the outhaul settings? The only time when I do change the outhaul settings would be if I'm going out and it is very windy indeed. So um, in that wind strength, I would pull the outhaul as tight as I possibly could um, because it just flattens off that bottom part of the sail a bit more, which is nice when you feel that you need all the help that you can get. Pulling the downhaul a bit more is going to help a bit more. So, yes, I do pull it on a bit more. But um, if which would suggest that I loosen it off for lighter winds, which it's not a conscious loosening. It's more of to get the actual gooseneck into the mast it is necessary to loosen the outhaul. So by doing that, that is how uh, I remember to loosen it off for the lighter conditions. So um, I would have a slightly looser outhaul. Like if I'm sailing a boat, which uh, like the F-18, um, if I was sailing in a slightly rougher sea, I'd sail with the outhaul a little bit looser, which is going to just give it a little bit more low down drive to get through the waves. But if, of course, I've got a deck sweeper, no need. Um, but with a, a Hobie 16, yeah, I just loosen it enough to get it in the mast track. That will be the general setting. So after having loosened it, we just tighten it afterwards, pull the creases out. That will be the general setting. And then if it's very windy, I pull it on as hard as I can. There we go. That is what I think I do. We've got Jeff at gearreport.com. Yo! And Jeff went out on a 38-foot cat last weekend. Wowzers. Toot's got some elevator music on in the background. Very good. And he asks, does it make a difference lifting the windward rudder on a reach? Yeah, I think it, it's it got to, hasn't it? It's what um, everyone who is racing a Hobie 16 at a high level, everyone does it. Everyone lifts the windward rudder both upwind and downwind to reduce drag but also it's because the um 16 twists uh more than other boats which means it is more difficult on a 16 to get the rudders perfectly in line um whereas i think it does make perfect sense that lifting the windward rudder is going to reduce drag but what I find, if it's windy, it's always nice to have a spare rudder in case something happens to the other one. Um, which, so for that reason, I do keep them both down. And also, on the, uh, I could get something here. Uh, here we've got a tiller arm from a 16. Um, if we have the rudder in the up position and we're trying to trapeze in the, what I've liked to call the joy rider TV position um, with your foot right wedged underneath the stock, you've got this part here, which is pretty sharp right above your toes, which means if you're getting pounded by waves, that's going to be pretty uncomfortable indeed. And also, this is going to be lower down as well if you lift it. So I would, as standard, leave them both down. But I think 
if if I was to go and race a 16, this is the only time I think I would do it. Um, if I was to go and race a 16, I would succumb to the peer pressure and lift the windward rudder um, because that's what everyone else is doing. And I've, unless it was really, really windy. Um, on, on, on the tornado, for example, also, I think maybe if I was doing a, a long distance race um, with enough wind just to lift the hull slightly, maybe I would lift the windward rudder to reduce that bit of drag. I've seen that Toot says, what about on the Hobie 17? I think if you're racing long distance and you really want to get the most out of the boat possible, then yes, make sure, of course, that your rudder system does work nicely. So when you lift the rudder, you're not left with an inverted cam. All right, we've got Kyle on board. In Canada, East Coast. Nice. Great to have you with us. All right. Laura says, watch out for black eye. What would you be getting a black eye from? Is this going back to pulling on the outhaul? Would that give you a black eye? Not sure. All right. So um, I've got some more preloaded questions. So what I'm going to have to say now is everybody who's watching live, please no further questions because we, we're coming up to an hour uh, that we've been going and I've got some preloaded questions to go through unless you've got something which is particularly pressing. Um, so the next preloaded question is from Scott, who says, when I was sailing in Santa Cruz on the Hobie 18, noticed some differences that I'm curious about. The Luff edge of the jib although furling and battenless kept a beautiful clean trailing edge compared to my luffy jib on the 16 why would this be it's because of the design basically um so how is it that the jib on the hobie 18 with no battens doesn't flap at all um it's all because of what we would call scoop in the leech so if we've got our jib like here if the sail was to be a perfect triangle we would have flappy leech and it would be no fun for anybody involved and if a jib was a perfect triangle, that is why we would need maybe just short battens in the leech to support it, stop it from flap, flapping. But this is an exaggeration. On the Hobie 18, what we've got is a scooped leech. Scooped meaning someone's been along and just scooped a load of sail area off the leech which means when we sheet in, there's no cloth that could flap on the leech of the jib. So that is how the Hobie 18 doesn't have the flappy leech like you might get on other boats. Like if you've got a 16 and you've lost one batten, that bit of the jib is going to flap like mad because there's nothing supporting that extra cloth that you've got out the back there. Scooped leech no flap. Um, and then also the sheeting angle on the 18 has been set up uh, to optimize the sail shape. So the sheet on the 18 does come a lot further back, um, which makes it also less likely to flap. All right. Next question on the Hobie 18. Um, also, the 18 tacked without much effort. Surely that's the whole design. Uh, yes, it is the whole design. The 18 doesn't have as much hole rocker. So it's just got a little bit of curve in the hole, whereas the 16 has obviously got a shed load of curve in the hole. But not only that, 
the pivot point on the 16 is extremely vague. It's all of this area, whereas on the 18, you've got either a centerboard or a small daggerboard, which means the boat pivots on that point, which a boat with centerboards or daggerboards is going to tack the easiest. Uh, the middle one is the skeg hull boat, like the Dart 18, where you've got this area where the boat pivots. So the asymmetric hull, like on the Hobie or the Prindle, uh, hardest to tack. Skeg hull comes in second, but then the clean winner is the centerboards or daggerboards. The deeper and straighter these boards are, the easier the boat is going to turn. All right, next point on Scott's Hobie 18 questions. It didn't appear that getting block to block would be possible on the 18. Is that true? Yes, it is true. And this is just purely because of the geometry of the rig and the way that the mainsail is cut. The mainsail is cut so it doesn't come as far down as on a 16. So, uh, and this is the same for pretty much every single boat that is not a Hobie 16. It's only the Hobie 16 and maybe the 14 where you would go block to block, where the actual blocks are pulled all the way together like that. Whereas on all other boats, you'd expect to have a gap in between the blocks, even when they're as tight as they'll go. And that is just because of the distances involved. With the Hobie 16, because of the way it's designed, the boom at the back sits very low, which means you must go block to block. OK, we're and the last one. Finally. We've got the fundamentals of tacking, but sometimes tacking in chop and waves stop the tack. Is there a fundamental for tacking in chop or waves? Yeah, I would say if you are tacking in a choppy sea, so if it's chop rather than waves, you just want to pick the flattest point possible. Um, the time when you want to initiate the tack is going to be when you've got the least resistance. So if you've got your wave or your chop, least resistance is going to be when the top of the boat, when the front of the boat is coming out of the top, because that bit of the boat isn't going to um, cause any resistance. So it's going to go through nicely. So the opposite to that, the worst time to tack would be when you're at the bottom of the wave and you've actually got more resistance than normal because, because of the shape of the wave, more of the hull is being dug in. So if you try to tack at that point, um, it's gonna you're gonna have more resistance. So there you go, Scott. I hope that helps. Next one in the preloaded questions comes from, or actually, let's just go in the live chat to see what's going on. Um Toot says, going out sailing Sunday, 12 to 15 knots. Very nice. And we've got Mr. Tony KP. First time. Nice. Great to have you on board. And I hope you're having a good time here on the Joyrider TV live Q&A. Um, you are very welcome. I like your uh, desert island with the palm tree there. It's nice. Um, Toot says, please hit like. Yeah, that's nice. Um, all right, next preloaded question comes from Diamond Tree Company, who says, uh, your videos are juicy with plenty of beans. Thank you very much. Um, how does the Dragoon differ from the Hobie 14, apart from just the length? All right, I should have kept this picture up because um, the Dragoon is so much easier to sail because of the shape of the hulls shape of the hulls were with the um the skeg hulls very easy to tack the dragoon also has got more volume so there's more liters of volume which means the dragoon 
is not going to sink down into the water as much as the Hobie 14. Neither of these boats is going to carry a, a huge amount of weight. I would say for a Dragoon, you don't want to go much above 100 kilograms total on there because the Dragoon is designed initially as a youth boat. So for two, let's say two 13, 14 year olds, um, double trapezing, spinnaker up, self-tacking jib, very nice. It would be like to scale, it would be very similar to an F-18 uh, without dagger boards because it's all just scaled down. So that is what the Dragoon was designed as. But what we find with the Dragoon is it works really nicely as a single hander for larger people because it is so much easier than the 14 to sail. Uh, the downside of the Dragoon compared to the 14 is it's not as quick, uh, which is because the 14 is massively overpowered for the size of the hulls, which means when you get it in the sweet spot on the reach, that baby just goes. But the Dragoon, very nice. Hobie 14, very nice. Hobie 14 is going to provide you with much more frustration as well because of the shape of the hulls, the low volume, the overpowered rig. It is more difficult to get the Hobie 14 to go in the first place. 14 also, because of all of those factors, it's easier to capsize as well, especially backwards. Because of the low volume, especially in the back of the hulls, if it's windy and you linger at the back of the boat for too long, it is going to capsize backwards quite readily. Um, so there you go. There, I think that's some good uh, comparison there. All right. Next one we have got to try to pronounce the name here. Second mouse gets the oh second mouse gets the cheese that is a good name i like that a lot uh because i didn't know that i thought the first mouse would get the cheese but um no second mouse gets the cheese in new zealand cool who says i bought a hobie 14 turbo great stuff um it's all been repaired tuned up had some fast sailing already uh, he's got a question about packing the boat with camping gear for a couple of nights. Where would you put most of the weight? And I'd like to add an outboard motor in case of becalming. I'm thinking of a Suzuki two and a half, two and a half horsepower, two stroke, but haven't seen many good transom setups just yet. Any thoughts on that? All right. So the 14, like we were just saying, hasn't got the most volume in the world. So it's not the perfect choice for camping, but you can do it. Um, let's just draw a picture. Now, the place on the... The place where we'd want to put the weight would be where we've got the most volume on the hulls. Um, so the place to do your packing would be just behind the front beam. Um, and what would be ideal if we look from above, if this is the trampoline, this is the mast just here, the ideal would be to pack everything as tight in to the front beam as possible. So we're keeping it really compact in that area there. So to have like a roll of stuff in there. If it's fairly nice weather, you don't have to worry about taking a tent because you can actually make a tent out of the mainsail and the boom. When you've got the mainsail down, hold on too many pens um when you've got the main sail down what you could do is attach the using the main halyard 
you can suspend the boom like this. So this is the main halyard. And then using the sail, you can put the sail over there. It will be open at the ends, of course, but you will have some sort of a tent. You could even, if you were really keen and you were going to do lots of camping, you could even get some bits of cloth made which specifically fit that triangle at both ends, uh, making quite a nice tent. I think this is something we're going to do well, once I've got a boat down here is we'll do some boom tent invention. But that's what I would do. And then in terms of an outboard motor, I have to pull a face at that idea because put even a small outboard motor, it's going to have some weight to it. And to have that weight at the back on a 14 is not ideal. I would say if you absolutely want to get an outboard motor on there, maybe have a look at something electric which will be very lightweight and maybe even see if it would be possible to mount something electric to like the dolphin striker where when you're not using it, this is, I'm just thinking out loud here. When you're not using it, it could go here like that. And then when you're using it, you just deploy it down like that. So you have it fixed straight and you still steer using the rudders. That would be the best um, the best alternative, I would say. To have anything of weight at the back of a 14 is just asking for trouble. You're going to capsize very easily. And I think capsizing with a, uh, an outboard motor is just going to make it an absolute nightmare to get the boat back upright. And then will the motor actually start after it's been submerged? Who can say? But that is what I would say on the topic of Hobie 14 camping. Um, let us know how you get on with that and send some pictures for show us your cat. That would be very nice. All right. Finn time lapse in Australia in the middle of the night um, says, I almost convinced my parents. I think this would be about a dragoon. But uh, then they saw the price. Yeah. The Dragoons, because they are a more recent design, they only actually came out in 2001, um, but there's not as many Dragoons in the world as there are Hobie 14s, which means you're not going to be able to pick up a Dragoon at Hobie 14 price. It's a shame. Okay. Toot says, I am taking old bad windsurfer sales to make more sail bags. Nice. And Toot continues, I put troll motor on getaway, arm on back for mounting, put battery in port for storage. There we go. Maybe that is some ideas for you there, Billy, for um, the outboard motor. But um, there was an episode of Show Us Your Cat, which was one uh, in the title. It's from South Africa. Uh, probably from maybe even this time last year, where the guys had a 16 with an outboard motor on board. You might get some ideas from that one. All right. Next preloaded question. And the last one, in fact, comes from Lysandra, who says, I don't quite understand why releasing the main sheet after turning increases your chance of a successful tack. Since we're close to the wind, won't having it in tight catch the wind faster. If we let the sail out like we are reaching, uh, won't that hinder the ability of the sail to catch the wind? All right. So, um, yeah. So let's um, put this question into less words. Why is it that I am saying we should? let the main sheet out when we're when we're uh, coming out of attack um right the reason is if we look at what uh what picture are we going to draw top view top view top view so
So if this is our boat, we've got a jib and a mainsail. And then we have got, let's call it the pivot point. The pivot point on the boat around here. So if the boat is not moving, if we put pressure behind the pivot point, which is here. So we're putting pressure behind and the boat pivots there. What that is going to do is turn the boat up into the wind like that. Um, now, why are we applying pressure behind the pivot point? We're applying pressure behind the pivot point by pulling the main, by having the mainsail in tight, because more tension in the sail is going to put more pressure in that part of the boat. So that is going to put more pressure behind the pivot point, which is going to turn the boat into the wind. Now, this is the case when the boat isn't moving forwards. So where a time when the boat isn't moving forwards is when you're head to wind going through attack. So that is why when we're head to wind going through attack, we're going to loosen off the main sheet, which means we're not going to have that pressure behind the pivot point, which means the boat isn't going to try to sail back up into the wind. This is the same reason why when we're going into attack, we sheet in tight. So we sheet in tight, pressure behind the pivot point, boat goes into the wind really fast. But if we don't free the sheet off when we head to wind, the boat is quite likely not going to want to come away from the wind at all. So we're going to loosen the main sheet. The more we loosen the main sheet, the faster the boat is going to turn away from head to wind. So if you're finding that you're stalling a lot of tacks, try easing more main sheet. And what you can actually do is as you cross the boat, if the wind's really light, you can actually grab hold of the boom or the bottom of the sail, pull it towards you. So actually you're pulling the sail out physically if the wind is quite light. And that is going to really help the boat to bear away on the new tack because we're going to be reducing this pressure behind the pivot point. Now, as you refine your technique, when you feel that your tacks are pretty sweet, um, you can refine your tacks by easing less main sheet, which, like you say, that is going to bring you back up to speed sooner. But easing more main sheet is going to help the boat to turn away from the wind. If you don't eat as if you don't ease any main sheet at all, the boat isn't going to be allowed to turn away from the wind, and that is quite likely when you're going to stall your tack. Um, also, if you don't ease the main sheet at the right time, the time when you want to ease the main sheet is exactly when the boat is head to wind. You'll know when the boat is head to wind because that will be the moment that the, the wind comes in the other side of the jib. That is the moment when you want to have the main sheet eased. So there you go, Lysandra. I hope that helps. Um, that is why we let the main sheet off. I think that's all I can say on that point there. And that brings us to the end of the preloaded questions, which brings us to the end of today's Q&A. So thanks very much for tuning in if you're here live or if you're watching later. Thanks for watching. Thanks for making it to the end. Well done. You should uh, treat yourself to something nice for making it to the end. I'll uh, be back next week with some more Q&A. Um, by the way, if you're wondering, how's the recruitment been going, Joe? Well, I could tell you, I have now completed the recruitment of staff for wild wind sailing holidays for this coming season. So there you are. That has been a big job 
finished. So see you soon with some more on Joyrider TV. And um, yeah, have a great sale this weekend. Keep it safe. Uh, if you're going out, check the weather forecast, uh, check your gear, check your tackle, and uh, see you soon. See you soon. Thank you. See you soon. See you soon.